I want to take you back to 2015. Uh, my wife and I, we, we decided uh, to kind of go on this, this adventure and get some chickens, like live chicken, real chickens. And uh, we're definitely not farmers. I lived like in an apartment in a townhome my whole life, city boy. And, and we tried to, to, to navigate this the best that we could. And we, we brought five chicks home. We ended up the first week with four because uh, my daughter, she thought it was so cute. She's just like, oh, you're so cute. And just squeezed one of them to death. And, uh, and so she didn't realize like what she was doing. So we wanted to give the chicken a proper burial. So we put it in the freezer. I don't know why I put it in the freezer. I just felt like it would prevent, you know, I, you see on movies, they put it in the freezer. You never know. And uh, so I wake up the next morning and, and she, she, she has the chicken. I'm in bed. She, she has the chicken in my face, like little legs sticking out of the box. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She's like, dad. Like, we, we need to do this. And, and the interesting thing was, it was Easter week. And so, you know, as a pastor, you know, it's resurrection week. So I just had this thought, just for a moment, just for a moment, like, bring the chicken to me, right? <laughs> let's just, let's try this out, God. Let's see what happens. But, uh, but it didn't work that way. And uh, the chicken was frozen solid. So I felt like the Lord was like, man, just let it go. Let it go. I uh, just want to make sure you're awake. You guys get that frozen? Come on. It's Sunday morning. Let's go. It's Resurrection Sunday. Uh, but but it, I think in all seriousness, it's, it's really frustrating. It's very painful when things die. It's, it's very frustrating and difficult when things aren't working. True story. Yesterday, I had to replace the cord on my dryer. I'm not a handyman at all. YouTube, thank the Lord for YouTube. So got it all put together, and in the process, I broke part of the plastic piece. I had to put some Gorilla Glue on it, which I cut my finger, just a mess. And then after all of that, something's wrong with the actual outlet. Doesn't work. All right, no big deal. Take a breath. It's Easter week. Uh, then I wake up this morning, bright and early, 5.15, take the dog out, feed him, all that good stuff. Get in the car to come to church. Turn on the ignition. Wouldn't start. Battery's dead. Happy Easter, Pastor. Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> and so I spent about 30, 40 minutes trying to, you know, jump in and do all this crazy stuff. Finally, I'm like, nope, I'm just going to be late. It just is what it is. It's just frustrating when things don't work. Right. I remember a time my, my daughter, we, we took my kids to Lost World. We used to love this place. And uh, you can see up at the very top, there's a little blue ball. And I, I remember I was with my middle child with Abby, and she wanted to come down here to this section with her mom, and I was all the way at the top. So like a good dad, I'm like, go for it. See if you can make it, right? And so, so she began to make her way down, and she did an excellent job. She made it all the way to the bottom, but then she decided she didn't want to come out and see mom. She wanted to go back up to the top. So like a good dad, I didn't call her, and I just watched her. I want to see, I want to see what you're made of, right? Let me see, see what you can do. And so, so she starts navigating. She's so excited. She's navigating through, and, and there's all these different pathways to get to the top, like it's, it's not like the easiest thing, especially I think at the time she was like maybe, maybe four, three or four years old. And, uh, and so she was trying to make her way and she starts off very excited and then little by little she's trying this way, she's trying that way, she's trying hip there, she's hitting dead ends here. And all of a sudden that smile goes to uh, like a little, bit of, a little bit of fear, but I'm okay. Yeah. And then she keeps trying, it's, nothing's working. And so then it goes from this to kind of like, and then eventually she just plops down, starts crying, right? And, and then daddy finally calls out to her, like, hey, I'm up here. I said, Let me. And I come down to her like a good dad would, right? But, but, but many of us know how that feels. Some of us, were following Jesus today, but we've lost sight of the reality of the resurrection. And so once again, we're trying all these different ways, trying to make life work, trying to make this happen, trying to make this relationship stable, trying to all these different ways, and we're just we're frustrated because it's just, it's, it's not work. We've, we've lost sight of the beauty and the reality of the resurrection, that God's way is better than our way and, and that God has a design for things, but we're trying to do things in our own way, in our own design, and we're, and we're frustrated. Some of us have just plopped down and start crying. And that's just how, that's just how you feel. And, and then there's others today that you're not following Jesus. We're so grateful that you're here. This is a safe place to be skeptical. Um, matter of fact, we're just, we are so grateful that you chose to spend your Sunday with us. Um, but, but so, and, and maybe you can attest to this too, where, where you've tried a lot of different things. On the outside, everything looks great. 
But inside, you've been navigating so many things, just trying to figure out how to make life work, how to find security, how to be happy, how to, all these different things, and, and it's still ending up in the same result. There's this, this compulsion to go on to what's next. Like Rockefeller said, how much money is enough? He said, just a little bit more. Just, just that, that chase where you're, you're kind of exhausted from it. You're sitting down. You're just like, man, God. I... And, and you're sitting down, and there's a cry in your heart. And I don't know what those areas are. Like, like, what in your life right now is dead or dying? Like, like, like what is it? is? Is it emotional? Some of us are wrestling with emotional death right now. We're stressed out. We're diseased on the inside. There, there's, there's this pressure that we feel. Maybe even some of you guys are under some financial pressure. And you just feel the weight and the gravity of that. You, again, you're smiling on the outside, but you're frustrated. There, there's this undercurrent of frustration there's this undercurrents of anger. You're starting to feel a little bit depressed, but you still got to put that persona out in front, like, like everything is good, and you're just emotionally trying to figure it out. Some of, some of us today, were, they we're experiencing relational death. Like, like maybe there's turmoil in the family right now, and here it is, another holiday, right, where we get together and we're reminded of how broken we are. Or, or there's, there's maybe a rift between you and a friend, and and it's just, been a, uh, it's, just, it's been there for a long time. Or maybe it's just happened and you feel that relationship starting to decay. Maybe there's been a betrayal. Maybe you're here today and you've experienced a divorce. Maybe it's been recent. Maybe it's been some time now, but you're just still feeling the ramifications of that. And there's still some areas of your heart that you're just, oh man, you're just feeling it. And you're just trying to figure it out. Some of you today, uh, you may have lost a loved one. Uh, I, I know that there are people in our church that recently have lost some loved ones. And I just imagine, you know, again, just this, the pain that some of you are feeling today. And, and we've been praying for you and standing with you as glorious as this time is. Sometimes it does remind us of the reality of, of, our, of our brokenness. And, and, and sometimes the relational pain, it's, it's, it almost feels worse than the physical, right? It just, it lingers for a long time. It hurts for long periods of time. There's really... It's, there's not a quick fix. And then others of you, you may be actually in experiencing some physical death. Like, like your body is, you're battling an illness and maybe it's been progressing for a long period of time. You, you're unhealthy. You just feel like, ah, oh, your body's hurting and, and you're tired. You're just wore out. And, and there's just this pain. And sometimes the physical death starts to affect the relational and the emotional, yeah. Right? It starts to take a toll on everything, and, and you just feel the weight and the gravity. You're just like, God, I just, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. And, and then I, I think the, the most important, probably because I'm a pastor, but also because I, I know the, the, the reality of this is some are experiencing spiritual death today, where, where there, there's like this distance from God. And, and I think this is huge because this affects how we deal with all of the other ones. And, and there's this, this sense of you're alive and you're breathing and you feel pretty good if circumstances are going well, you're good. The moment things go wrong, it's, it's, you're, you're a mess. But you can't let anybody know. So you you got to keep it together, but only you know. And, and there's a sense of I'm alive and I'm breathing, but, but, and I'm even, I maybe got a good job, maybe, maybe I'm off and I got a great career. Maybe everything is in place, but you still only feel like you're existing. And, and then some of you, you, you've been through some pain over this last season. And so it's just, it's messed you up a little bit. It's distorted your image of God. You're just like, man, I don't know anymore, God. I don't know if I can trust you. I don't, you, you become a little bit cynical and, and you feel it like your soul is dry. You feel thirsty. And then again, some of you, man, everything is, is great and you can't figure out why you're still unhappy. It's like, man, like all the boxes check, but there still seems to be this vacuum on the inside of me. And, and I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. The, the beautiful thing is, as followers of Jesus, we have this promise. Is that Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is available to you. Like, it's not like special people get this. No, it's, it's those who put their trust in Christ get this beautiful reality of the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living on the inside of you. So can I just tell you that, listen, the same Holy Spirit power that rose Jesus from the dead is now alive and well in us. Like, that's huge. This word, this phrase, mortal bodies, 
I looked it up in the Greek, and the original language, it has this notion of, of things that are subject to death, that the Spirit of God is able to give life to things that are subject to death, things that are liable to die. You see, the, the beauty of the resurrection of Jesus is the resurrection of Jesus just isn't an event that happened back in the day. The resurrection of Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit is to impact our every day. Like, like this isn't just, hey, let's kind of, you know, celebrate, hey, Jesus, all right, way to go, man. Uh, let's move on with our life. No, no, it's the Spirit of God that's able to give life to our bodies every single day, no matter what we're going through, no matter what pain, no matter what suffering, no matter what is dead or what, is, what has been decaying, that there is hope, that there is healing, that there is life because of the resurrection. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. He says it this, Easter is death working backwards. It's like death was like, gotcha, and Jesus was like, nope, let's reverse that. Right, And so, so I, I, I would say, I, I would propose this, that if you're taking notes, you can jot this down, that Jesus wasted the grave so we wouldn't waste our life, so that our life wouldn't be wasted, so that everything in your life right now, all the good, all the bad, all, all the ugly, all the pain, everything, because of the reality of the resurrection, screams that God has purpose in it, that there's promise, that there's power available, that God is still able to give life to the areas that have died or are dying. In other words, it's this, Easter interrupts death. Now, you might be asking, well, man, that's cute, preaches really well, yes and amen. But, but how does that work, like, practically for me? What, is, what does that look like? What do, what do I need to do? That's a great question. Like, like, don't people who live like this, like, aren't they really special? Because here's the reality, some of us there are things that have died that aren't coming back, but can I just tell you, God can still bring life in the midst of that death. And I got so many stories that I could tell you about that, that beautiful reality. But you said, like, people who live like that, they must be special. Like, I, I don't know if I could really, if I could really live like that, but I, I would totally disagree, and so would the Bible. In fact, the Apostle Paul was an average guy just like you and I. He has apostle in front of his name, so it sounds like he's special. No, he, he had a call on his life that he answered. God said, hey, I got plans for you. Paul said, all right, let's roll. And so, so Paul says it this way in the message version. He says, we don't want you to be in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. He said, it was so bad. We didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we had been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. Paul was just like, listen, I'm a real guy going through real life in need of a real God. I'm, like, I, I'm, I, I've been through some stuff. And he says, but, but man, it was the best thing that could have happened. What could be so good about that, Paul? Because instead of trusting our own strength, our own wits to get us out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. It's almost like when you're in, in, in the, 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 the most difficult spot, which seems like the worst place, God's like, man, there's life in that spot. Because Paul said this way, he said, man, so we were forced to trust in God totally. Not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. Paul's like, we're not, I'm, I'm not anything special. I just said, hey, I think it's a good idea that we trust the one, we're like we're facing death, we feel death at our doorstep. Let's just trust the one who raises the dead. And, and that in all of his pain and all of his hardship, he said, we're just gonna look to God. That's fair game for everybody. That's an all play. He says in Romans chapter four, he says, this is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations, speaking of Abraham. Like what motivated God to bless Abraham in such a way where he'd be a father of many nations? This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. He believed. You're like, you're like what do I have to do? Believe. You're like, that's my problem. I have a really hard time with that believing part. Whole resurrection from the dead, cute, come to church, do my little thing. Let's, what are we eating for lunch? It's the believing part. And some of you as followers of Jesus, you've stopped believing. Like you've, you've lost that, you've been through some things, and so it's, it's just like you've lost your way. And, and Easter is an invitation and a reminder to say, oh, come on, you've already tasted and seen. Like you already know that there's nothing out here that's going to satisfy outside of Christ. That, that he's able to make all things new. That he's able to create new out of nothing. Ex nihilo. Isn't that awesome that we serve a God that can create something brand new out of nothing? 
man, that, that's, that's a word for somebody today. Like, like you see barrenness and God says, I can create something out of that. Out of your emptiness, I can create something amazing, something brand new. But others of you are like, man, I just, I have a hard time with the believing part. I, I, I mean, Pastor Matt, this is cool, man. Appreciate it. Great service and all. But, but I, I just don't believe in organized religion. And can I just tell you, man, Christianity is perfect for you because there are so many of us that are unorganized. So many of us. <laughs> like you jump on our leadership team, you'll find out that even we're quite unorganized sometimes. Like if it wasn't for Jesus raising from the dead, we might not even be here right now. Uh, but, but you have this sense of, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual. I feel a connection to God and I want to, you know, I, I do want to go to heaven. And I like the idea of being with God when I die. But I just have this problem when somebody tells me something like, unless you're born again, you can't have this relationship with God. I just, I don't like that. And, and that, that's fair. I, man, I totally get it. But let me just propose something to you. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it's not true. Because the reality is, is how do we know something is true? Is, is does it correspond with reality? Yeah, See, I think why, 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 the, why God is, is so tough for people in the West, here in the States. Uh, one scholar said it this way. It's because we have a, a religion of consumerism. Like, like how we live our life, we, what do we do? We, we walk down the aisle and we're like, what do I want? I'm going to pick that one. I'm going to pick that one. So, so a lot of times with God, we're like, I kind of like this about God, but I really don't like that. So don't grab that. Let's just pick that one. I kind of like this from this one over here. So let's throw that one in. And then guess what? If it disappoints me, I'll just take it back. I'll just return it. Costco. Shout out to Costco. Like some of you today need to repent because you know, you go to Costco because you know, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy this for five. I'm going to use it for five years and I'm taking it back. <laughs> Costco is like the ultimate spiritual consumer. Like they believe in the resurrection. They're like, hey, just bring it back. Ten years, we'll, we'll bring it back to life. <laughs> some of you guys, you're guilty that you know it too. You're like, oh man, like God is speaking to him right now. Right? But, but here's the deal. is is. I love what Mark Driscoll says. He says that God is not a product. He's a person. And God hasn't created you as a shopper, but a worshiper. See, if you're a shopper, you're only consumed with yourself. What do I want? What do you ever go to the store hungry? You're just like, oh, man. You just throw every, like Jackie knows when I go to, to Trader Joe's hungry. Because I just, I grab all this stuff. And we're just thinking about ourselves. But when you're in a relationship with somebody, a healthy, devoted, life-giving relationship you should not only be thinking about yourself. Like all of a sudden your primary concern becomes that other person. And so now I'm not just thinking for myself. I'm thinking about, you know, my wife and my kids. Like what's going to be best for them? What's going to be best for us? Right? And so I try to live like that. Sometimes in my relationship, I still, it's all about me. Anybody there with me? But, but if, 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 if you want to be in your relationship for a long time, you got to correct back quickly. Right? You got to get back to, hey, let me think about you. Let me think how it's going to impact everybody else. And so, so the beautiful thing is, is God is not a product. He's a person that wants a relationship with you. Not, not a religion for you to join. A, a, a relationship for you to pursue, to get involved in. Now, now the, the trouble is this, though. Anybody ever been to a formal living room? Any, some of you guys have this in your house. Like nobody even lives here. Nobody even does life here. You just want everybody to see how awesome you are when they walk in your house. It's just pure. Got a Bible sitting on the, on the, little, the little desk. And, and this, I don't know about you, but these rooms make me uncomfortable. My, my buddy Carlos, back in the day, his mom had a formal living room, plastic on the couch. And we just, we, we hated that room. Like we, ne we just wanted to get through that room to the family room so we can sit down and relax and eat some food and do life. And some of us, we treat Easter like a formal living room, don't we? Like, man, you are lucky I came to this church. I'm just going to walk right through and then we're out. Don't even look around. Just walk through. Don't say hi to anybody. I'm not here. You're not going to change me. Just going through. Right? And then some of us, our relationship with God has become like this now. Some of you, like the CEOs, Christmas and Easter. Man, I'm there. But, but it's just a, it's, it's a checkbox. It's like, hey, man, I kind of did my, my good deal. You know, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're glad you're here. But I'm saying there's so much more. God is not a product. He's a person. God's not just looking for you to check a little box that you, you know, read the Bible a little bit, you prayed a little bit. No, God wants to do life with you. Yeah. See, the scary part is this, is, is some of our hearts are like a formal living room. Like we're like, hey, God, you can come in, just take off your shoes and don't disrupt anything. Wow. Like this isn't holy ground, but 
This is my ground. So, so you can come in, just don't, don't touch anything. Don't go, no, don't go there. Just pass on through. And we're good. You good? I'm good. We're good. But how many of you guys know a relationship just doesn't work like that? A relationship disrupts things. And all the married people said amen. amen. A, a relationship, it, 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 dis, like it, it disturbs some things. They're going to get disappointed. You're going to get let down. There's going to be things that you don't quite understand. You're going to have to work through. And Jesus is like, listen, I don't want a formal living type of relationship with you. Let's get to the family room. I want to do life with you. I want to abide in you and you and me. He says in John 15, 4, he says, abide in me and I in you. This word abide means to make your home in. He's like, man, let's, 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 let's relax. I want to make my home in you and you make your home in me. And he says this, he says, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, if you're new to church, that sounds like a lot of churchy language. But basically, it's like this. Jesus, said, Jesus is saying, hey, make your home in me. And there's gonna, you're going to experience life. You're going to experience growth. You're going to experience fruit. I'm going to do something in your life that you never thought possible. But you gotta be, you got you to be connected to the vine. So, so i I got I to gotta disrupt some things. So relationship with Jesus, number one, it disrupts our endings. Easter disrupts our endings. Anybody see a movie that you thought you knew the ending, but it wasn't? Yeah. Or you expected something better and it was disappointment? I remember when Jackie got her wisdom teeth pulled. We watched... It was, it was when Lost, remember that, that, mo- that series Lost yeah. was on Netflix? We binge watched that thing for like two days. No kids. We didn't have kids yet. We're just like, let's stay in bed and watch Lost. And, and at the end, so we finally get to the end. And it was the most disappointing ending. Like they had me on the hook the whole time. And I'm like, that was the end? Never watching these things again, right? True story. Never watched another series. Jackie's still like, hey, it's okay. You need some freedom. We, we can talk, we can walk you through this. I'm like, no, I'm never watching that. What, what about a beautiful mind? Anybody ever see a beautiful mind? That, that whole time you're watching, spoiler alert, the whole time you're watching, there's all these characters in the film, and then all of a sudden you realize at the end they're all figments of his imagination. And then it messes up the whole movie. You're like, I got to go back and watch it all over again. Perfect for marketing, horrible if you're a consumer, right? Like, I got to go back and watch this movie all over again. And so here's this context. The disciples are afraid. Jesus is dead. He was crucified on a cross. They're hiding from the Jews. They don't want to get killed. It's the third day, and the women go out to bring some spices to the tomb. And it says in Luke chapter 24, verse 21, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared. But Jesus is about to disrupt this ending because this anointing of the tomb of Jesus was, was an act of love. What they would bring the spices for is, is to cover up the stench, the decaying of the decaying body. And so the, the women come into the tomb in the morning with spices. What, what, they, what it basically reveals is like the disciples, they did not believe that Jesus was going to rise. They did not believe. Like they looked at the cross. They watched it. They're like, man, that dude is not coming back after that. It was too brutal, too horrific. And so they're bringing spices down to the place where they cannot change. I'm not going to be able to change this. It's, it's, he's dead. It's impossible. I'm bringing the spices down to what's over, to the finality. At least we can do is pay respect and cover the stench. But we know in this moment that we're expecting not life, but the smell of death. We're not expecting life at all. In other words, they, 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 they saw through this lens of God is nowhere. God is no, like he, he's, he's dead. Like after 400 years, Jesus comes. 400 years of silence, Jesus comes on the scene. Miracles, power, well, I'm, all these different things. And now once again, we're, we're, we're lost. We don't, we don't know what to do. We thought you were the one and, and now you're dead. But how many of you guys know sometimes we presume things dead that God said, that's not supposed to die. Like I wonder how many things in our life that, that, that we have killed, that God said, no, I want it, I want, that, that could live. Like, I wonder how many relationships could have been spared, and that God said, listen, I didn't want it to end that way. I wanted that to live, but we couldn't see it. God, you're nowhere in this. You're dead. You're, you're, not, you're not here. And so as a result, what happens? We let go of the fight. We, we lose hope. We give up faith. 
And, and something that was never supposed to die, what do we do? We bring spices, proverbial spices. Let me just try this to cover up the stench of this. Let me try to get this to cover up the mess here. Let me try to use this to cover up my pain. Let me try to use this to cover up my hypocrisy. Let me use this to kind of cover up my dead religion or, or, or feel my persona and my pride because I got to feel good about something. Let me, let me just bring some spices because the reality is these things aren't living. So the best thing I can do is try to cover up the smell. I just don't see him here. And can I just tell you that, I mean, there are some people in our church right now. I, I talked to, I talked to uh, a woman this last week, just lost her husband to cancer. Everything about her life says everything should be dead. But she's like, Pastor Matt, we've made peace with God. Our faith is strong. It's painful. It's agonizing but we're moving at, we're, 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 we're trusting God in this. Faith is still on the rise. We, we have, have uh, uh, some families, uh, families in our church who, who lost some little ones. And you just imagine how tragic that is. As I talk to them, their faith inspires me. Because I'm like, man, it'd be so easy for you to just to be like, God is nowhere. We have, we have another gentleman in our church who's, who has cancer right now, and, and I'm texting him the other day, and, 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 and he's just still, him and his wife are just still, I mean, just so full, I mean, he's on his way to get radiation on his head, and he's like, always oh, had a couple screws loose up there. I mean, just, just we're holding on. We haven't moved, whether it's in this life or the next life. We know that God is the God who raises the dead. While everybody else sees God is nowhere, we see God is now here. We see God is now here. Not God is nowhere. That God is now here. And everything right now about their life says your faith, your hope, your joy, everything should be dead. And they're like, nope. Because God is now here. It disrupts. Listen, sometimes God's endings are a little bit different than ours. There are things that are supposed to live right now. Don't render them dead. Don't lose sight of this reality that God is now here. Not God is, God is not nowhere. No, God is now here. But then there's some things in our life that need to die. Like, like we keep trying to resurrect them back up. And God's like, that needs to die. You need to let that go. Leave it alone. I mean, have you guys, have you guys ever experienced that, that beautiful reality of, of the Lord saying, don't pick that up. Don't, don't, don't do that. No, not. And you're like, it's all good, Lord. I'm just resurrect. Come back. And listen, and some of us, it's that sin that so easily entangles us. And the Lord's like, let that die. Like I, I died in rose so that you wouldn't be a slave to that anymore. Why do you keep going back? It, there's, there's some things, our pride, our anger, our unbelief that God's like, you don't let it die yet? Because here's a beautiful thing. If we're going to abide in him, if we're going to make our home in him, that a, 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 a vine cannot produce fruit, a branch cannot produce fruit unless it abides in the vine, but a great vintner, what do they do? They always prune the branches. Why? For more fruitfulness. So there's some things that God is like, yeah, we need to cut that off. Because it's not healthy. Like, there's some relationships, not marriages, but some relationships in there that should have died a long time ago. Like, and you know it. You're like, I should not be with this person. And you keep falling in. You just keep giving way. And it's just dysfunctional and a mess. And God is like, man, let it, let it go. I want you to grow. I have something so much better for you. God's endings are different than our endings. Yeah. Easter disrupts our endings. The second thing is this. Easter disrupts our doubts. It disrupts our doubts. Now, in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, it continues, and it says this. As they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but they found the stone, the stone rolled away from the tomb. It says, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Now, if you read the Gospels, you're going to see that it wasn't just, that you're going to see a different number of angels in different Gospels. John's gospel, you're going to see a different one. And so, so some of you skeptics may be, and I used to be super skeptical. Some of you skeptics may be like, see, they couldn't even get the number right of angels. Like, come on. But, but even secular scholars will agree that that's actually more evidence for the validity of the text rather than them all having the same story. Like, like when I grew up, 
and, my, and me and my friends, we would go do dirt. That means crime. And, and what we would do is this. We'd say, all right, man, if we get caught by the police, this is what we're going to say. You better, and there was always that one guy like, you better say this, right? And, and this is what we're going to say. And as soon as we got caught, they just knew. Uh-huh. We're telling the story, same story. They're like, they didn't believe that at all. Because they knew that we rehearsed it. If the, if the disciples, number one, they didn't even believe that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Number two, if they got together and tried to coerce it, they would have came up with a much better story. But what we see is different perspectives. We see different perspectives from eyewitness accounts. That one is for free. But they were perplexed. They were confused. Because unlike what we think sometimes, the Bible and Luke is, is a medical doctor. And he's not afraid to say, these guys are confused. These guys are perplexed. They're, they're looking at an empty tomb. Jesus was dead three days ago. Now the stone is rolled away. What in the world? And, and some scholars would say that we suffer from chronological snobbery. Meaning we look at them in the ancient world and we're like, you guys were so behind. Like we are so f- much further along than you are. And like, like they didn't even believe in stuff like science. But I would, propo- I would beg to differ. Like, like Joseph and Mary, right? Mary, an angel appears to her and says, listen, God's gonna, you're going to get pregnant. God's going to put a baby in your womb. And Joseph wasn't like, when, when she came to Joseph and was like, hey, Joe, I'm pregnant. He wasn't like, praise God. So good. It's amazing. It's a miracle. No, because he understood science. He understood how babies were made, right? And he wanted to divorce her. If it wasn't for an act of God and an angel appearing to him, he would have been gone. Why? Because he understands how babies are made. And these guys understood what it looked like to look at a dead person. And they're like, he's gone. They're perplexed. They're looking at the tomb. Have you ever, maybe this Easter, you are looking at the tomb just like them and you're confused. You're perplexed. And Easter is about to disrupt your doubts. Like, like, you're looking right now, and you, you have to make some decisions, and you don't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. Maybe some of you guys are looking out into the world, and you're like, it is, our world is crazy. And there's fear, and there's anxiety. Maybe you're thinking about the deeper things of life, and you're thinking, you've been thinking a lot more about meaning in the future. Like, what is it? Like, oh, I don't, what is this life all about? And maybe some of you here today, you're, you're, you're just... You're just like, man, I just can't believe in a God that would allow all this evil and suffering in the world. Like, what kind of a good God is that? Man, I'm so so glad you asked. Because here's the beautiful reality, is Easter disrupts those doubts. Because evil and suffering can't exist apart from God. Like, the very fact that we have a category for evil and suffering points to the question and the reality of God. See, to assume evil and to assume suffering is to assume God. Let me explain. To assume evil is to assume good. Like there's there's good in the world. But to assume good is to assume there's a moral law. Like, Like how do you know what's good? We live in a world of relativism now where that may be good for you but not good for me. We live in a world that says there's no such thing as absolute truth. It's only the truth that you believe. But even that statement then would not be true if there's no absolute truth. See, so to assume that there's a moral law is to assume that there's a moral law giver. How do we get this moral law? And to assume a moral law giver is to assume God. You see, if if evolutionary theory was correct and we are just animals, none of this would matter. Like evil and suffering, we wouldn't even care. I, I mean, really think about it. Evil, justice, suffering, absolute categories for right and wrong, I have a dog. He doesn't care. He's not like, hey, you messed, you really missed it on this one. No, absolutely not. Listen, it would be survival of the fittest. You do you, I do me, people and opinions. That's it. No evil, no suffering. That doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Listen, we, if, 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 this is, if this is for a listen, if evil and suffering does not exist, we have nothing to put God on trial for. So how could we even say, listen, to assume that evil and suffering is why we don't believe in God is to assume that he exists. Are you guys tracking with me? And so that very claim raises the question and the perplexity as you stare and think about the empty tomb. Wow. 
Now, now, even though the Bible doesn't speak about every single pain that we go through, what the Bible is very clear on is that we serve the God who gets involved, who got involved and did not leave us in the midst of this evil and suffering, did not just leave us down here like, figure it out, like me with my kid in the, in the tower. Figure it out. No, God came down. The, the thing that separates Christianity from all these other quote-unquote religions is every other religion says you must do in order to get. Jesus said you couldn't. That we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That as your pastor, I stand before you today, a sinner saved by the grace of God. That all, none, none of us, listen, if I compare myself to some of you and you compare yourself to me, all right, we might tit for tat, but if we all compare ourselves to God, we all fall short. Like at what point do we say, hey, God, it's, it's me. None of us feel that. And so, 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 so hear, hear me, hear, hear where I'm going here is, is that, is that this, this, this beautiful reality that, that the Lord Jesus gets involved. He's the only one that said you couldn't do. So I'm coming down. I'm going to take the wrath of God upon myself for your sin. Like I'm going to pay your debt so that you can experience life. And see, see, even right now, death is still perplexing to us. It still doesn't make sense. I've done funerals for kids. I've done funerals for young people that have been murdered in cold blood. And can I just tell you, there's not one atheist there that's saying, survival of the fittest, weaker vessel. No, everybody feels the brokenness and the fracture. That something's wrong with this picture. Like, no parents have to bury their child. Are you, like, what, what in the world? Something's wrong. Yes. There is evil, there is suffering, there is a real God who came to do something about it. Everybody feels the gravity. What you're feeling in that moment is the brokenness as a result of sin entering into humanity and fracturing everything. That's why we look at evil and suffering and, and death and we say something is wrong. It's not right. The only way that that is possible is because God has written this moral law into our hearts. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter three that God has written eternity on the hearts of every man and woman. That's why death is perplexing, because we know that it's not supposed to be like this. And Jesus enters in and makes a way, makes a way. So Easter interrupts our doubts. Lastly, Easter interrupts our fear. It disrupts our fear. It says, as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He died for our sin, took our payment. Like, you and I deserve the wrath of God because of our sin. It may be hard to bear. You may not like to hear that, but it's the truth. But Jesus said, you don't have to pay for that. I'm going to pay on the cross. And he says, I must be crucified, and on the third day I'm going to rise. And then the women were like, oh, yeah. And they remembered his words. See, so many of us were still seeking the living among dead things. Why? Because we either have forgotten or we've never known his words. And, and, and when the resurrection, when they get this reality of the res resurrection, fear goes away, they run back and they tell the 11. And most of the disciples, even then, were like, this is a fairy tale. Are you serious? Get out of here. Except Peter. It says that Peter got up at once and ran to the empty tomb. And he says that he looked in and he's just like, and he marveled. You see, what, what keeps us from believing in the resurrection of Jesus? It's not the evidence. There's tons of evidence. Jesus lived his life in public. He died in public. He was raised, appeared over 500 witnesses. An eyewitness account goes a long way in court. But, but, it, but that's not the issue. The issue is many times we have a pre-prejudice towards God, so we never look at the evidence. We start with assumption that, no, that's a fairy tale. No, that can't work. No, 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 no. And so you never investigate for yourself. You never investigate his words, what he said. And when they remembered, they said, man, he did say that. Man, he did rise from the dead. You know, remembering does something to you. I came across this picture of my girls. They're now nine and seven. And you know, I got so many things going on in my life. Like, oh, well, I want to hit tackle this next hill, and we want to hit this next mark. We want to reach as many people as we can, all the stuff. And then I hit see this picture, and remembering this reality of how fast my kids grow, all of a sudden it stops all of that and says, what, what's important? What's really important? What, what really matters? And 
I would just urge you today to come back and remember the words of Jesus that I must die at the hands of sinful men, but I'm going to rise again on the third day. You see, Easter disrupts our fear because it moves us from what we think to all of our assumptions to remembering what he said and what he's done. And that just changes the game. The disciples, as they were telling all about what had happened, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them and he said, peace be with you. See, peace is not a circumstance, it's a person. And his name is Jesus. And he says, but the whole group startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you so frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. And then they stood there in disbelief, right? With filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have something to eat? Come on, don't you love God? Like, listen, boys, I'm trying to do life with you. Let's sit down and let's eat some food. I'm alive. Look at me. I'm here. Let's, let's do life. Let's share a meal together. And look what they do. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and they ate, and they just watched. He ate, and they watched. They're like, whoa. I, I, bro, this, this dude really rose from the dead. It's really him. Listen, his presence brings peace. Religion will stress you out. A relationship with Jesus We'll lift it off. Let me, let me close. Let me, let me close. Let me close with this. A story of a father and son loved artwork. Matter of fact, they collected Picassos and Van Goghs and all, all these major um, artists in, in their collection. Well, Vietnam came and the son was a courageous young man. He said, man, I'm, I'm going to go and serve my country. And he went off to Vietnam. They were in a fight, in a battle. One of the guys got wounded. So the son, he carried this, this young man on his, on his shoulders, and as he was carrying him back, he was shot and killed instantly. And so, so the guy who, whom, whose life was saved by this young man showed up at the father's house, and he said, sir, knocked on the door, he said, sir, I'm the guy that your son saved when he died. He said, I, I, I can never repay you. I don't even know what to do. He said, but he told me how much you guys liked art. So I painted you a portrait of your son. That's all I got. And the father was overwhelmed. He's like, man, you really captured his emotion, everything. So the father took it and looked at it often, put it on the mantle, made it prominent over every other painting. About a year later, he died. And they were getting ready to auction off the estate. And so the, the auctioneer took the gavel and hit it and said, the auction is in session. And he started with the painting of the son. I said, can I get 100? Silence. So he just persisted. Come on, could somebody want to buy this painting? Can, I, can we start with $100? And there was kind of a, a shuffle in the crowd. They were like, listen, after a period of time, like, come on, let's get on with it. Nobody wants the painting. Let's get on to the, to the other ones. So, but he just persisted. And so finally, the gardener was like, hey, I, I've known this family for a long time. I got, I got 100 bucks in my name. I'll take the painting. And so he hit the gavel, he said, okay. And everybody was relieved, like, oh, finally, like we can move on and actually get some, to some of the good investments. And, and the, the auctioneer said, okay, going once, going twice, sold for $100. And everybody was like, okay, well, let's, let's go. And then he hit his gavel one more time and he said, auction, auction done. I'm like, what do you mean auction done? He said, there was a, a hidden stipulation in the will. The father made it very clear that I couldn't reveal to you till now that he who gets the son gets it all. 